Amen. Would you remain standing as we hear from the word of God this morning? Our sermon today comes from Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. And then skipping down to verse 20. My son, Be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your your sight, keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. And may God speak to us through his holy and inspired word this morning and may his name ever be praised, amen. You may be seated. Well, there's a famous story of Albert Einstein, and he's going to preach at, or he's going to give a lecture at a university, and his driver turns to him and he says, you know, Dr. Einstein, I've heard this lecture about 30 times now. I bet I could give this lecture just as good as you. So Einstein looks at him and he says, they don't know what I look like, so why not? So he gives them his hat and his coat, and his driver proceeds to give the entire lecture in front of this university, and he pulls it out flawlessly. At the end of the lecture, this a scientist, mathematician, comes up to Einstein, and he's trying to pin him on a, a question. He's trying to pin him into a, a corner, and he asks him a difficult question, uh, thinking it's Einstein, but it's really the driver, and the driver looks back to him, and he says, you know what? That is such a simple answer. I think even my driver would be able to answer that question. So he pulls Einstein over and he actually answers the question of the mathematician. Well, Einstein was known for being a school dropout. He had trouble finding a job until he came to the realization that he had been told his whole life a series of mathematical equations that he needed to memorize and he realized he was never taught how to embrace knowledge. And this morning, what we're gonna be talking about is we're gonna be talking about how do we embrace wisdom? In Proverbs 1, we learned what the foundations of wisdom are, what the blessings of wisdom are, but we're gonna be learning how to apply that to our life. And like that driver, we might be able to recite every single proverb We might know them by heart, but if we don't know how to embrace it and we don't know how to apply it, we can't answer the questions of life as they come up. So as we begin, let's look at Proverbs 4, 7. It says this, it says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. And you might say, well, wait a second, back in chapter one, verse seven, it said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This says the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. What does that even mean? Well, if Proverbs 1, 7 is the origins of wisdom, Proverbs 4, 7 is telling us how to embrace wisdom. The word get in the Hebrew actually means to buy to purchase. It's always used as a transaction. It's never something that is just given to someone. And so what Solomon um, is doing here is he is giving us an analogy of a bride and a groom, and the price to be paid for his bride is the dowry that is to be paid. And so we see this play out in verses five through eight. It says, verse five, get or buy wisdom get or buy insight. Then we see the bride respond. Verse six, she, wisdom, will guard you. Verse seven, get by wisdom, get by insight. And in verse eight, she responds again. She, wisdom, will exalt you. She will honor you 
if you embrace her. So if the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is like the awe that you have for your bride, and verse four seven is like the marriage contract. This is like the wedding vows that you would give telling you how to embrace wisdom. So the question becomes, what is the price? What is the dowry to be paid that he is asking about? What is the cost of wisdom? Well, he's very clear in this chapter that the dowry to be paid is your heart. When we look down at verse 23, this is our big idea for the morning. It says this, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance. The New International Version says it like this. It says, above all else, guard your heart. Above everything, above all of the treasures of the world, above all of the relationships that you have, above all of these things, it's that important. The word for guard in the first clause here is the word shamar. It carries great power in the Hebrew language and it's actually used as a noun here. And so as it literally translates, <clears throat> it would translate as above all things to be guarded, above all things to be jailed. It was the term used for a prisoner that was in prison. Above all things to be kept in custody and jailed, guard your heart more than anything else. And if Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, is telling us that, we should listen. So how do we guard our heart? Well, this morning I wanna talk about three truths of how to guard your heart. The first truth for embracing wisdom and guarding your heart is this. Are you a child or are you a son? When we look at verse 20, it says, my son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. And we see this phrase over and over and over again throughout the Proverbs, my son, my son, my son. And we compare that to Pro Proverbs 22, 15, which says folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And so the Israelites, when they would have read this, they would have understood this is not a biological connection that's being made. It's saying that a, a child is foolish. They have no wisdom, but a son sits under instruction. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need to understand what God's voice sounds like. And in order to do that, we have to be a son. We have to be willing to be a lifelong learner of wisdom. The pursuit of wisdom is a concept that we see throughout the Old Testament. There's a figure of speech called a mirrorism. And in English, uh, a mirrorism, it, it's something that is two opposites, and then when put together, they make up the whole. So if I said, I searched the house from top to bottom, it means I searched everywhere, right? Well, in Hebrew, there's a Hebrew mirrorism for the analogy of wisdom, and we know it well. It's the knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil, when it's talked about in the Bible, is the knowledge of everything. It's the knowledge that is reserved only for God and angels. We see this appear five times, this phrase, the knowledge of good and evil, appears five times in the Old Testament. The first time it appears is in Genesis chapters two and three, and we read about the story of the fall and Adam and Eve, and they go into the garden and the Lord tells them, he says, you shall eat, you can eat of any tree except for the fruit of the tree of what? The knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent comes to Adam and Eve and he says, if you eat of that tree, you will be like God, knowing everything. And of course, we know what happens next. They fall into sin and they are cast out of the garden because that was a knowledge reserved for God. The second occurrence we see is 
In 2 Samuel 14, 17, it's talking about King David. And it says they're talking about King David, but it's referring to him as an, uh, as an angel. It says, for my Lord, the King David, is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. Because this was a character trait of God and angels. The third appearance of the knowledge of good and evil brings us right back here to our Proverbs. It's the story of Solomon. When Solomon was 15 years old, his father, King David, died and he was given the throne. And he had to figure out what to do and the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and he says this to God. He says, and now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child, meaning I have no wisdom. I do not know how to go out, and I do not know how to come in. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. And we know that God granted him that request, and he became the wisest man to ever live. So you may be asking, wait a second. So Adam and Eve asked for the knowledge of good and evil, and they were rejected. Their sins were imputed to all of humanity and they were cast out of the garden, but Solomon asked for the knowledge of good and evil and he was rewarded for it. Well, theologian Herman Bavink says this, at the fall, the issue is not primarily the content of the knowledge that humans would gain by disobedience, but the manner in which they would obtain it. It was the manner in which they wanted the knowledge of good and evil. It was a heart issue. So truth number two in embracing wisdom and guarding your heart is this. We must watch what comes into our heart and what goes out of our heart. Because everything we do in thought, word, or deed, it stems from the heart. We see this in verse 23, the second half of that verse. It says, above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because from it flows the streams of life. It affects everything that we do. Pastor Rob spoke a few weeks ago about how we can't follow our heart. Why? Because we have a wicked heart. Our heart is deceitful above all things because at the end of the day, the problem is not out there. The problem is in here. So we have to watch what goes in and what comes out. Our hearts are vulnerable. They are easily manipulated by the world and we have to be aware of that. So what happens if we neglect these things? If we say, I don't want to be a son. I don't wanna watch what comes in and out of my heart. Well, the alternative to embracing wisdom, the alternative to guarding your heart is a hardened heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 14, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. You see, the problem isn't that we need to fix our heart. The problem is we need a new heart. And God makes us an incredible promise in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone, I will remove your hardened heart, and give you a heart of flesh. So truth number three this morning for how to embrace wisdom and guard your heart is that the Bible ultimately says that in order to guard your heart, you can't fix your old one, you need a new one. The fourth, occurrence of this phrase, the knowledge of good and evil, appears in Isaiah chapter seven, starting in verse 14. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Of course, this is a prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Then in verse 15, it says, he, Jesus, shall eat curds and honey, Curds and honey would have been the food of children. 
He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. It's saying Jesus will be but a child and he will already have the knowledge of good and evil. You see, Jesus did not have to become a son because he was the son. He was wisdom. There's a story that my seminary professor, Brian Matson told in our class. There's a little girl, her name was Jenny. She was six years old, living in Alabama. And there was an explosion in the family fireplace. And poor little Jenny was severely burned. They took her immediately to the children's hospital in Birmingham, hooked her up to a ventilator, trying to save her life. The doctor said that her body was over 80% burned. They tried to uh, see if they could do skin grafts, but they quickly realized there was not enough good skin on her body to do the skin grafts. Then they said, well, we'll we'll do some lab-grown skin grafts. And they said, that will take up to two weeks and we we don't have the time. She's not gonna last that long, she's going to die of an infection any day. The father pleaded with the doctor and he said, doctor, please let me give the skin off of my own back for my daughter. And the doctor said, I am so sorry, sir, but for reasons that we as doctors and for reasons that medicine cannot explain, donor to donor skin grafting does not work. The body will reject it and we don't know why. A few days go by and the mother is visiting now and she is speaking with the doctor and she tells him, Jenny's twin sister, Sydney, is her best friend and she is gonna be devastated when she loses her best friend. The doctor said an hour went by and the words of the mother stayed with him. And then he said it hit him like a lightning bolt and he ran down to the lobby and he found the mother and he said, did you say that Jenny had a twin sister? Yes, and she's gonna be so devastated when she loses her best friend. Is she an identical twin sister? Yes, she is. That is exactly what the doctor wanted to hear. It took two emergency hearings between a district court judge, a medical ethics committee, an interview with Sydney and consent from the parents. But it was decided that they would perform a once in a lifetime surgery that had never been performed before. They would take the skin from happy and healthy Sydney and they would graft it onto broken and dying Jenny. And the doctor had good reason to believe that this procedure would work. They perform the procedure and miraculously the skin grafts took and Jenny and Sydney are alive and well today. And Sydney looks back at that decision and she says it was the best decision that she ever made. You see, what the doctor realized that day is that Jenny and Sydney had identical DNA. She was a perfect match identical DNA. And that's an analogy for us this morning of the father. The father, he he looked down at us and he said, you have a hardened heart and I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. But he made the promise that one day I will take that heart of stone and I will replace it with a heart of flesh. And when he sent his son Jesus, because he became a man, because he died for our sins as a man, because he shared our DNA, he is able to give us a new heart. Today, Jesus offers us a heart of flesh in exchange for a heart of stone. It says in Deuteronomy 30, verse six, and the Lord your God will circumcise or change or make new your heart and the heart of your offspring 
so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You see, God commands us to love him with all of our heart. And we can't do it because we've got a hole in our heart. Our old heart can't love him with all that we have. We try, I know we try, but we can't. But the amazing thing is that he commands us to love him with, his, with our whole heart, but he also provides the means for us to do so because he provides us with a new heart through his son, Jesus Christ. Truth number three, in order to guard your heart, we can't patch our heart, we need a new one. And when God gives you that new heart, jail it, keep it in custody, guard it with your life, because God tells us that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, if you receive that new heart, you will receive the peace of God that transcends all understanding. And what will that peace do? It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The fifth occurrence of the phrase, the knowledge of good and evil appears in Deuteronomy 139. This is the story of the Israelites going into the promised land and God tells them, because you have disobeyed me, I will not permit you into the promised land. And so it says this, it says, but as for your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your children, the unwise ones, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. They shall go into the promised land, and to them, the unwise, I will give it. I will give the knowledge of everything, and they shall possess it. You see, if you accept a new heart, when you, when you die and you go stand before Almighty God, he tells you that his promise is you will receive the knowledge of everything. He will give it and you shall possess it. And to those of you this morning who do not know God, I'm sorry to tell you that you are dying of spiritual heart failure. You've tried everything, I know you have. You've tried filling the holes in your heart with so many different things. We've tried the law, we've tried substances, we've tried all sorts of things to fill the hole in our heart, but we're doing that with our old heart. And your meds are wearing off and you need a heart transplant. And God the Father He wants to give you a new heart, but he can't. But I have good news for you this morning. We have found a heart donor. His name is Wisdom, and he wants you to embrace him. His name is the Word of God. His name is Jesus, and he has your DNA. He is a perfect match. This morning, would you trade your, your old heart in for a new heart? Would you trade your rags for your riches? Because that is what he offers to us this morning. Solomon tells us, get wisdom. The price is your old heart. Let's pray. Father, we are incapable of fully grasping the depths of evil and negativity that stem from our heart. Only you, O God, in your infinite wisdom have the knowledge of good and evil and can truly comprehend all we have done to sin against you, including the darkness of our hearts and the extent of our sin. Lord, we have wronged you in so many ways, but what an incredible promise you have made to give us a heart of flesh in exchange for a heart of stone. Thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus that because he was man, 
he could fulfill your promise to bring us life and life eternal. Jesus, we are grateful for your sacrifice and for offering us a new heart, a heart that longs for righteousness and wisdom. We know that when we trade in our old heart and we have a new heart, that we will start to have desires we never had before. Why do I wanna help that person now? I never had that desire before. It's because we have a new heart. It's because we have the spirit of God within us. Father, may your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, you tell us in your word that the, the peace will transcend all things. Would it guard us on this day? And Holy Spirit, would you incline our ears to wisdom and help us to be attentive to your word? I pray for those this morning with an old heart. Would they come to experience the transforming power of your love? We pray this in the name of the one called wisdom, Jesus Christ. Amen.